mandala, a circle, a sphere, a circle or sphere of friends and family, of earth, of the cosmos, of psychic integration. The circle or sphere of the mandala draws together good and evil, the sacred and the profane, the visible and the hidden. Mandalas are the world's richest religious symbols. They are visual scriptures that teach about the nature of reality. They are also ideal models or templates for personal transformation. Buddhism is literally a system for awakening, a way to help individuals discover their own true nature. Buddhas are fully mature persons whose minds are clear and strong and free from anxiety and misconceptions. <laughs> The reason one should practice religion is to attain a happiness greater and more lasting than worldly happiness. Buddhism teaches that happiness comes through helping, not harming others. Nonviolence is the root of both happiness and Buddhism. The Buddha, an Indian prince who renounced his power and wealth, taught for 45 years. His message was that suffering comes from unrealistic conceptions and selfish behavior that can be completely eliminated through practice. This is true for everyone caught in the wheel of rebirth. Gods and demigods who experience sweet but temporary pleasures in heavenly realms. Humans and animals who experience a mixture of pleasure and pain. Miserable pretas who cannot satisfy their hunger or thirst. Tormented beings born in hot or cold hells. Tibetan Buddhism calls wisdom and compassion the two wings that enable one to soar to the state of complete awakening. The wing of wisdom is personified by the Buddha Manjushri, whose flaming sword cuts through delusion. Wisdom is not an accumulation of knowledge, but rather the understanding of emptiness, that the things of the world and we ourselves lack any independence and unchanging identity. The wise are those who shatter the illusion of a fixed essence or nature. They understand that all things have their identity only in relationships. The other wing, that of compassion, is personified by the Buddha Tara. With the extra eyes in her palms, forehead, and feet, she sees all suffering. According to tradition, the historical Buddha transformed himself into the exalted form of Vajradhara. His teaching has become known as Tantra, the stream of transmission. It is also known as Vajrayana, or diamond vehicle. Vajradhara grasps in his crossed hands a diamond scepter, the Vajra, and a diamond Vajra bell. These symbolize his compassionate, blissful method and wisdom. The tantric teaching introduces a very direct and evocative way to heighten and unite wisdom and compassion. It is called deity yoga, the discipline or yoga of the enjoyment body, a special physical projection of Buddhas. In deity yoga, an ordinary person uses imagination to change the world and his or her own body. The vivid visualization of oneself as a Buddha and one's surroundings as pure, based on deep compassion and meditation on the interdependence of all things, 
is thought to bring about a transformation of consciousness so profound that one spontaneously becomes what one has imagined. Tantra is practiced in secret. It is taught only to a very selective group of people with great abilities. If those teachings were taught to those of lower faculties, then the problem arises that people will not grasp those teachings, and instead of being helpful, they will become misguided. This mandala is the sacred circle of a Buddha whose name, Vajrabhairava, means the diamond terrifier. He does not fit our stereotype of a Buddha, for he is awesome and apparently consumed with lust and rage. This appearance is ironic, for as a Buddha, Vajrabhairava is actually the destroyer of the poisons of lust, hatred, and ignorance. Vajrabhairava is the fiercest form taken by Manjushri, the Buddha who personifies wisdom. According to legend, Manjushri took this form to subdue Yama, the Lord of Death. For killing Yama, this form of Manjushri earned the name Yamantaka, the Death Subduer. Whenever he is depicted, Manjushri's face is seen in his hair. Angry deities, you know, they are not, are not angry at all. Actually, like a Vajabharava, you know, he looks a f fist full, you know, uh, uh, you know, for ignorance, you know, ignorance. But, uh, but uh, you know, uh, he's really, uh, he has a deep compassion uh, in his mind. But uh, it doesn't mean that uh, Vajabharava really draw anger, you know. It's, uh, it's just artificial looking, you know. Like, uh, uh, like you know, uh, some parents, you know, they, they, just, uh, they just act like uh, they, they're, uh, they're angry at their children, you know, to, uh, to uh, stop their misbehavior. But uh, really, they have a, really a, a kindness in their mind. Vajrabhairava actually appears as two persons, a male and a female, united in sexual embrace. He represents blissful and compassionate method. She, Vajravetali, is wisdom. In reality, the two are one. Their blue color is their wisdom, deep as space. Their nakedness is their abandonment of ordinary conventions. Flames surround Vajrabhairava's head as he radiates tremendous energy. His bristling hair is his achievement of nirvana. His horns are the dual reality of things and their emptiness. His nine faces are nine types of teaching. His terrifying weapons and ghastly trophies demonstrate his powerful opposition to the demons of desire and hatred. The fifty freshly severed human heads around his neck are the purity of his speech. The humans and animals under his right foot are so-called common accomplishments, such as levitation. The birds under his left foot are the uncommon powers of enlightenment. Highest Yoga Tantra practice is based on transforming emotions specifically that attachment from being with the consort and having sexual union. One experiences the bliss of sexual union, but one is able to control that bliss and incorporate it into the path. That bliss enhances one's own practice. Specifically, the bliss enhances the subtle consciousnesses that realize emptiness. They become very powerful. The difference between the classes of Tantra is how well one is able to use attachment this way. Some cannot handle more than just gazing at a consort. Others can smile, touch, or even embrace. 
With the proper partner, it is possible to manipulate energies in the body so that one experiences far more subtle and powerful types of consciousness than in ordinary waking life. These levels of subtle consciousness are experienced at various times of life, such as in the transition to sleep and at the time of death, but at those times it is extremely difficult to notice and use them. In the controlled context of deity yoga, a particularly powerful and usable occasion of subtle consciousness is during sex. And we practice, you know, in certain time, uh, the uh, subtle consciousness arises, you know, uh, during, uh, during sleep and uh, deep sleep, and uh, when you sneeze, and uh, when you are in sexuality. So uh, this sne sneeze, sneezing time and sneezing is too fast, you know, it just yeah. it does, that's all, right? Yeah. And then in deep sleep, it's impossible to utilize your subtle uh, con uh, consciousness, you know. The only, uh, that the only time you can uh, utilize your subtle consciousness is uh, 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 sexuality. And here, uh, here, that uh, deities are embraced, but uh, this is really very different from uh, ordinary sexuality. Here, that uh, you know that uh, they they draw they draw the energy, but they do, don't let the energy. You know, male and female uh, secret places are blocked. Males uh, secret pl uh, place are blocked with the uh, vajra, and the females uh, secret place are blocked with the uh, uh, lotus. You know, so they don't let the energy. They just draw back the energy. You know, and uh, in the same time, you know, uh, they just uh, try to. Uh, try to realize that the bliss is an emptiness. Bliss is not bliss and uh, so there's a non-duality of bliss and emptiness, you know. So here in the West, you know, it's, uh, sometimes it's uh, said to hear that uh, the deities with the consort uh, as a sex symbol, you know. I, I don't think uh, it's uh, really, uh, uh, you know, that, you know. So uh, if you understand well, then that if you attain the, the wisdom of non-duality emptiness, then uh, you will be Buddha soon, yeah, you will be Buddha. Tantric practice begins with imagination. From the flat sand mandala and its symbols such as flowers, wheels, and swords, one imagines a pure world and imagines oneself as its Buddha. This world is three-dimensional and richly colored and detailed, as in this computer rendering of the mandala's central palace by the late Pema Chögyen of Namgyal Monastery. While imagining the marvelous realm of Vajrabhairava, it is always essential to remember emptiness, that phenomena are empty of any fixed nature. Tantra makes an extremely powerful and startling claim. The mandalas of palaces and deities are nothing more and nothing less than the mind that realizes emptiness appearing in form. The power of this insight experienced inseparably with bliss, shatters the practitioner's attachment to the ordinary world. Yet it makes possible a return to that world with the maturity to do what is appropriate, whether that be providing comfort, discipline, or even destruction. Champa, Tenzin Hlunbo, and Tsering Namgyal have arrived at the Trout Gallery of Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, to begin to make the sacred circle of Vajrabhairava. The monks of Namgyal Monastery are masters of mandalas. At least three years of their 13-year training is dedicated to the theory and construction of mandalas. In addition, each monk must complete a two- or three-month meditation retreat for each of the principal mandalas. The Vajrabhairava mandala, like several others, is often executed in sand. It is fragile and transitory, 
emerging from and returning to emptiness. The sand is made from rock crushed with mortar and pestle, then sifted and washed by hand. It is dyed with water-based pigments. In former times, on special occasions, semi-precious stones such as turquoise and coral would be crushed and spread on sand mandalas. On some mandalas, larger stones are also allowed. The Vajrabhairava sand mandala consists of a square palace which rests on a circle of earth, which in turn rests on a huge lotus blossom. Around it is a fence to separate the mansion from the fires of desire, hatred, and ignorance, and the cemeteries representing samsara, the world of death and rebirth. Below the visible surface lie several important levels. At the bottom are four pancake-like planes made of pure elements, a yellow square of earth, a white circle of water, a red triangle of fire, and a blue bow-shaped wind layer. On top of them stands an inverted three-sided pyramid, internally red for bliss, externally white for compassion. Its shape is intentionally womb-like to indicate that Buddhas are born from wisdom and compassion. It also replicates the shape of the Buddhist Axis Mundi, the world-centering Mount Meru, which has this unusual inverted profile. Above the surface is the blue foundation of the palace. Embedded in this base are gigantic crossed vajras, which symbolize compassionate method. In the sand mandala, which gives us an aerial view of the palace, the base is invisible, and we see only the points of the Vajras. The opening ceremony is held on a beautiful autumn day on the Dickinson campus. Several hundred people pack the gallery. Most of them watch from the upper level. Many will return frequently over the three weeks that the monks work on the mandala. The monks have already drawn all of the principal lines in white. Before any sand is laid, they then install the 13 forms of Vajrabhairava, the so-called deities, with recitations of mantras. The monks offer prayers to Vajrabhairava and other Buddhas, and reaffirm that this mandala construction is for the salvation of all beings. Thank you. Faring and Champa begin to apply sand at the very center of the mandala. They will work outwards, filling in the outlines they have drawn in chalk. Their tools are simple but highly effective. The principal implement is the chakpu, a long tin funnel with ridges. When one chakpu is rasped against another, a fine stream of sand flows from its narrow mouth. So it is, uh, people some, just, they have a uh, sort of different reaction about watching or viewing that mandala. Some people say it's just to watch or to view the mandala, they get some energy through that mandala and they feel really peaceful and they come uh, again and again. Some people say the vibration of the funnel is really sort of different, gets a different sounds and something like that. They feel really pe peaceful. If we put up lots of sands in the funnel, then it makes different sound. And we catch or hold it very tightly it makes a different sound. And uh, if you need something, sort of dots or something special, tiny or those things, then it makes a different sound. So, I don't know. <laughs> so, it's kind of, sometimes when I do the mandala, so sometimes I just, people love the sound, so I try to get that uh, 
I'll say, oh, got a very good sound. So we just, if I hold, then I know oh, it doesn't make um, good sound. So I just bevel it very gently. Before the monks begin work each day, they visualize themselves as Vajrabhairava and visualize the three-dimensional mandala. For them, the making of the mandala is the materialization of their contemplative vision. Champa and Tsering must draw the figures upside down. Everything in the mandala is executed so that it faces Vajrabhairava and Vajravetali in the center. The monks follow strict canonical directions concerning the forms, colors, and proportions of the mandala. However, they are free to embellish and invent, particularly with regard to the depiction of offerings. It's not much uh, uh, creativity, yeah, but that, uh, in some places, you know, if you are a skilled uh, mandala maker, you know, there is a, a possibility, potential, you know, to, uh, to create something, you know. You know that in some places, you know, uh, that like in the text, it said that uh, you can make a, you know, a sand painting with a, uh, any kind of offerings. So it's up to the artist what kind of offerings. Uh, if, if you know, you know, uh, you know uh, that uh, the art well, then you can make, you know, that uh, you can fill that place with, uh, uh, you know, that the symbol of uh, eight auspicious symbols, you know, eight substances, five sensual objects, that kind of uh, skillful person, then you can fill with uh, one mirror or, you know, one uh, symbol, you know, something like that, you know. In the very center within the palace is the lotus throne of Vajrabhairava and Vajravetali. In the center of the lotus, on a red sun disk, Vajravairava is the blue Vajra. The light blue color dot is Vajravetali. The scarf is their clothes. Around the lotus throne is a series of columns connected by a lattice that divides the area into nine parts. Each segment contains a deity. Counting the deities in the doorways, there are 13. The five colors in the inner grounds represent the five so-called Buddha families, groupings that symbolize the five aspects of Buddha wisdom and many other qualities and facets of the teaching. In the white east, a wheel of Dharma for Vairochana. In the yellow south, a collection of wish-granting jewels for Ratnasambhava. In the red west, a lotus of purity for Amitabha. And in the green north, a flaming sword of discrimination for Amoga City. The lotus that represents the Buddha Amitabha is one of Buddhism's most renowned and potent symbols. The lotus exemplifies purity in the midst of impurity. It is a flower that grows up through the muck of ponds and swamps, but unfurls pristinely on their surface. Similarly, the path to enlightenment runs squarely through the everyday world. In particular, the tantric path uses the passions and vulgarities of life to transmute its travelers into Buddhas. The lotus is also said to represent the vagina and womb of Vajravetali. It reminds us that the mandala can serve as the birthplace for Buddhas. Deities outside the lattice are guardians and therefore are stationed in the doorways. In the white east, we see a Vajra hammer. In the yellow south, a Vajra club. In the red west, a double lotus. And in the green north, a sword. The five layers of the walls of the palace symbolize the five wisdoms of the Buddhas. 
the wisdoms of discrimination, equality, accomplishment, reality, and reflection. Like a rainbow, the walls are translucent. Dakinis are female figures who may be Buddhas, spiritual guides, or simply advanced tantric practitioners. In the first band of sand outside the palace walls, a red plinth, we see many dakinis making offerings. The other four bands show ornaments on the walls and roof, laid out to the side so that we might be able to see them. The red band is a frieze above the walls. The blue band and black bands hang from the eaves. The white band is the top of the wall. As with everything in the mandala, the ornaments have profound meanings. The roof is embellished by victory banners and other decorations which extend out over the green grounds surrounding the palace. The white garlands hanging in the black band signify the realization of emptiness. In front of each of the four doors, four pillars support ornate eleven-layered porticos. They have been laid out to the sides so that we see all that they contain. The porticos are heavily ornamented and contain all of the features of the roof of the mandala. They differ only in the type of offerings that are featured above the hanging white garlands, such as a mirror, a bowl of jewels, a bowl of fruits, or even the eight auspicious symbols standing for blessings such as long life. The porticos are themselves surmounted by a dharma wheel with a lotus base, to either side of which are a buck and a doe. In the green grounds surrounding the palace there are many more offerings. A golden vase holds a wish-fulfilling tree with blue leaves and seven auspicious symbols of royalty. In their shade sit yogins, or siddhas, who are emanations of the Buddha families of the different directions. Namgyal monks have unique training. While they do concentrate more on ritual arts than do most other monks, they also study Buddhist philosophy in a rigorous way memorizing classic Indian texts and debating their meaning. They understand not merely how to make mandalas, but their deeper significance. Namgyal Monastery was founded in the 16th century by the second Dalai Lama and has always been the Dalai Lama's private monastery. In Tibet, Namgyal was located in Hwasa's Potala Palace. In 1992, it established a branch in Ithaca, New York, in a small house on a residential street. Namgyal's curriculum has been refigured into a four-year course for American students. Yeah, it's really interesting, you know, like uh, when, when we, we make mandala, right? We, we, we have an idea why we are making that, you know. We know, we, we, yeah, we know the, the meaning of symbols, you know. And uh, when we do our rituals, then uh, we have a background of philosophy because of that. Then we know that. Otherwise, it's like you know, the, if you if you teach parrot to you know to do to to do something, they do that, right? It's like uh, they they have, they don't think anything, right? So something like that. The palace rests upon a gigantic lotus of sixty-four petals. The petals are related to the theory of the subtle body which speaks of subtle centers of energy called chakras, or wheels. This is extremely important, for a practitioner learns to manipulate the body's energy to open the chakras, which allows for the unfolding of subtle states of consciousness. Here, within the three major channels, red and white substances melt and flow, causing great bliss. The last three circles represent the Buddhist spiritual path. Renunciation of attachment is represented by the outmost cemetery circle. Compassion is represented by the fire circle. And wisdom is represented by the lotus circle. 
Outside of the lotus ring is a vajra fence of linked vajras, signifying the realization of emptiness. The colors of the fires in the fire circle represent the five wisdoms. The ring's black background symbolizes obstructions to be removed. There are eight cemeteries corresponding to the eight joys experienced in the higher stages of practice. Although they contain images of death and destruction, these actually represent pure phenomena, for the result of tantric practice is the transmutation of ordinary reality. For instance, each contains the fire of subtle body heat, the water of compassion, and so forth. The standard elements of the cemeteries are fire, a dead tree, an image of death, a living tree to represent the central channel of the subtle body, ocean water and a cloud, a three-peaked mountain symbolizing immovable wisdom, a reliquary, and a yogin who performs religious practice with a thigh bone trumpet and drum. The thirteen deities of the Vajrabhairava Mandala reside in their places until they are asked to leave. Then, the mandala is dismantled in order to demonstrate the truth of impermanence. Champa and Sering offer prayers that ask the deities to return to their pure lands. Champa then circumambulates the mandala base. Then, he picks up the sand representations of the deities one at a time. Starting at the outer edge of the mandala, where the borders of the southern and eastern quadrants meet, Champa makes an incision toward the center, cutting the energy of the mandala. He repeats this at the boundaries of the other quadrants, and then bisects each quadrant. Most of the remaining sand is swept into the center of the mandala and deposited in the jar. Some is given to onlookers so that they might bless their own dwellings. The monks are not disturbed by the dismantling of their work. As Champa said in concluding remarks, the beauty of the mandala is in its creation, not its duration, and in its effect on those who watch its progress. A lot of people, you know, uh, people uh, tell us that, uh, that, that this energy nearby, side by the uh, mandala base, you know, really it happens, you know. One thing uh, it's really, uh, you know, it uh, uh, impresses me is that uh, whenever we, we make a mandala, just people come, right? People come, and a lot of people come again and again. Then uh, they see same face, you know. Then they, they just talk, you know. They just introduce themselves. Then they, they make a friends, you know. Then they make a sort of community.